Oh, electric hovercraft. The key word here, or key phrase, is work in progress. What you're going to see is um, where I've got to, as of yesterday, in a two-year-long project over lockdown, to see how far I can get in terms of an electric, all electric, not hybrid, um, cruising craft. Um, what I'm going to explain is uh, the things that uh, I've found out that are wrong. That red box over there is full of several thousand pounds worth of blown up parts. Um, the other boxes are mostly kit that works. Uh, you can prove that at your leisure. And I'll show you pictures of the fire that charred that motor uh, towards the end. Um, I don't know all the answers. Uh, Howard produced a very wonderful article, which I totally agree with, which basically says uh, if you want uh, even the smallest of F3 craft, you need 30 kilowatts or so of battery uh, that will weigh more than the craft does. It uh, costs you a uh, commercial price is around £30,000, I think I worked out. And um, basically, it doesn't work. Not feasible. So I'm taking on a smaller challenge. I'm not trying to build a racing craft. I'm trying to build a cruising craft. Because a number of the problems are easier. Not just the amount of battery capacity, um, but um, things like uh, what Howard didn't mention is if you're going to run a motor for 10 minutes flat out, you're going to have heating problems on the motor. You're going to have heating problems on the controller. You could have heating problems on the battery, and Conrad will tell you all about that in great detail because his new job is all about the cooling fluids for batteries. Um, sorry, but my battle plan is not to have batteries that need cooling fluid. Right? I'll explain how later. So it's work in progress. Where does it start? It starts with this guy, Owen Ellis, who um, spent at least five years uh, experimenting and going through lots and lots of bits of kit. Um, I'm doing what I wasn't told not to do, which is stand in front of the uh, speakers. Um, can we turn the sound up? 3,000 RPM, approximately five meters from the craft. Okay, so this is a noise test. It's five meters from the craft, and that's the noise. And you heard Paul Hibbard talk in an ordinary voice. He wasn't shouting. Okay. When we de decode that in terms of our standard distances, that lift fan, which is this, is producing uh, 59 dBA at 25 meters. To benchmark that, my craft is 72 dBA. Um, Every one of the marlins around here are around 84 dBA and the racing craft, well, 100 and upwards. And don't forget, every 3 dB is a doubling of power. So that lift is quiet. So that gets me interested. Then Owen has a go at making the thrust. Now, the motors that he and I are using basically start out life as um, model aircraft motors made in China. This is going to be the lift motor that will power that fan. Um, the Chinese have developed these into rather larger motors, um, which they will sell you for paramotors, paragliders. You know, strap it on your back, jump off a cliff and power your way. Yeah. We know one or two people that do that, don't we? Um, electric versions of those. What Owen did uh, a couple of years ago, he got two eight kilowatt motors, that's around about 10, 11 brake horsepower each, which is the biggest motor he could get at that time, and put them back to back, contra-rotating. He only ever wired up the first one, and he only ever ran it, as you can see here in his garage, and one or two of you I know have been to his garage in Australia, outside Cindy. Um, and he tested it for a few minutes, then went off to Canada, and two years later he was still there. So that project didn't get very far, but let's have a listen to what Again, can you turn the sound up? All right, you 
you've got the message. That is not quiet. Okay, it's in the garage and everything else, and that's it's echoes. But it's not quiet for two reasons. First of all, that's the standard Chinese glass, um, carbon fiber prop that comes with those motors. And they are narrow, they run at three to 4,000 RPM, high tip speeds, high noise. Um, and actually, as I discovered somewhat later, a lot of the noise you can hear that from that is coming from the motor. And it's coming from the motor because it's driven by a Chinese-made controller, this thing, I'll explain a bit more about that later, which is feeding a technical bit here, a trapezoidal waveform into the motor, which is making those shrill noises that sound like a, a jet engine. Okay? Secret is to, is to feed a sine wave into the motor. Um, it's actually more efficient, but the key thing is it's a damn sight quieter and you get the kind of electric motor experience you think you're going to get. So, Owen had a go at a thrust system, a test, and then, as I say, got stuck in Canada. Um, talked about all this on a tech talk just on two years ago, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can pick up on where he got to. So I started, on paper, doodling around with not fitting that ch narrow Chinese fan, but fitting a, a, a modern multi-wing fan, a uh, curved blade, scimitar blade um, fan. Uh, in fact, it's a 7Z, a four-bladed um, 7Z fan, just over a metre diameter. Uh, and I found that on paper, if I could run that roughly half the speed of the Chinese fan, I could get the same sort of thrust, but I could get um, a noise level in the low 60s. My craft, quietest in the world, is 72. So I can get maybe 6 to 10 dB quieter than that. Um, so that got my interest, because as you know, sound is a, 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 an issue. So I term, termed the thing ultra quiet. Um, then of course along comes all the carbon neutral stuff, and we all watched the COP26 conference and got fired up about, well, mm, did we ought to be going around guzzling fuel? And I could add, as of this week, did we ought to, can we afford to keep guzzling fuel? Um, so there's a whole carbon neutral argument. Um, but there's also a STEM argument. Over my uh, 55 years in Holcraft, I've, met, made, I've seen, met many people who got into engineering because they were exposed to Holcraft in their teens, from the express air rider onwards. Um, and some of these are old grey-haired guys who have now retired and are finally building the Holcraft they wanted to when they were a teenager, or buying it. Okay, so there's a, a fantastic capability that we have got to get people interested into engineering when they're teenagers and younger than that. Except that, as Dan Turnbull put it to me a few months ago, what are we doing? We're training them in 50-year-old two-stroke technology. Is that what we're gonna, they're going to meet in their working life? Probably not. They're going to meet some version of electric. Maybe not the generation we've got now, maybe something beyond that. But we ought to be training them in that sort of technology. So why go electric? Well, for me, there's those three things. And of course, I like the challenge. Well, how to do it? There's two broad choices. You can go down the lithium battery route, and the technology is just about available. Sadly, most of it comes from China, which I wish wasn't the case, but it is. Um, or you can go down the hydrogen route. Sorry, the type size is a bit small there. Hydrogen, I think, is the long-term answer, uh, or some variant of it, because it's lighter, it's easier to handle when it gets productionized. Um, probably going to get longer range for a different density and da-da-da. But it isn't there now. I, you know, I'm 74, I haven't got forever to wait around for this hydrogen technology to be available from Amazon. And I'm afraid the lithium is. So I'm going with the lithium right now. Um, and so I'm trying to work through how do I make a lithium-based technology work in the context of a cruising craft. If we learn from that how to eventually make a racing craft, well, that would be fabulous. But right now, it's a cruiser. And the key thing is that if you're going down the hydrogen route, for example, I, could, I, I can buy a one and a half kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell. Um, made for drones, something that will take in hydrogen as a gas and give you electricity. And it's yay big and weighs about five kilos. It's, you know, but one and a half kilowatts is nowhere near enough. I need 
18, 20 kilowatts for thrust, 5 kilowatts for lift. Doesn't compute. However, whether I go down the lithium route or eventually the electric hydrogen route, because there are others, like converting a piston engine to run on hydrogen, which Nigel builded in 1976. Where are you, Conrad? Uh, right? Dad did that in 76. Took a mini car and ran it on hydrogen. And you were walking around in nappies, I believe, at the time. I was quite sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, nothing's new here. But if we're going down the hydrogen electric route, and I'd argue strongly for that, because electric motors, etc., are much lighter, um, more controllable. You probably don't need the drivetrain, all those belts, pull shafts, etc., etc. Um, then the key thing is that the motors and the controllers are common to both routes. So if I sort out the motors and controllers in this project, but using lithium, because I can get it now, then hopefully that's something that can be picked up in a, an electric hydrogen approach. If it turns out to be what JCB and your dad did, i.e. converting a piston engine, essentially, well, that's, that's fine. I don't think those solutions will solve my noise challenge. That's, that's the key thing for me. All right, so what? What are we talking about? These are the four main components. Where am I going to get my power from? And this is entirely the problem that... Um, Howard talked about. Am I going to get it out of 13 amp mains? Well, I could. Um, I'm, I'm going to have about a 15 kilowatt hour battery to give me two hours of cruising range. I could charge that on a one and a half kilowatt charger overnight in about 10 hours. So that's a solution. But then, as Howard points out, most of our race sites and a lot of our cruising sites don't have mains electricity. So, how are you going to do things? You can have a generator? Well, you could, but it seems a bit daft to have a super quiet craft running for 10 minutes and then a generator running for six hours to recharge it. There's bloody noise in my ear, right? It doesn't really feel like... And plus the carbon neutral argument. So a solar panel. This is a 100-watt solar panel. You've probably got them on your campers, all right? Uh, just under 100 quid each from Amazon. Next day delivery. Weighs a couple of kilos, flexible, as you can see. Um, I'm going to have a go with these and see where I can get to, basically. Because I've got a cruiser, 13 foot by 7, I can get eight of these permanently on the craft, on the sides, on the ducts, on the nose, and on the battery bay lid. So eventually, at least, when you see this craft, it will have these all over it. Um, that'll give me, on paper, 800 watts, I think my cruising consumption is going to be around 8 kilowatts for lift and thrust. So on paper, 10 minutes of sitting in a lovely sun would give me one minute of cruising, on cruising speed, on paper. I keep stressing on paper because they only produce 100 watts when they're perfectly angled towards a clear sunny day, etc., etc., and that isn't going to happen. I mean, by definition, some of these are on one side of the duct, which is maybe facing the sun. Some are on the other side of the duct, and they ain't facing the sun. So you're never going to get 800, but you might get something towards it. So when I've gone half an hour down the river to the pub, and I'm sitting there enjoying for an hour or two, in that hour or two, it's got a bit back in the batteries. That's, my, that's what I'm trying going to research. I'm going to try that. In addition to that, I've got 300 watts of those panels already on my camper. I can get 600 watts on the roof of my camper. Um, I could get more of them around the, um, you know, around my camping encampment. Um, there is some technology I'm watching closely coming out of a uh, company, startup company in Newcastle that basically has a, a solar panel as Fablon. So you could stick it on a surface or maybe you could stick it on your gazebo. So that, you know, campsite gazebo that you've got over the craft becomes in five years' time, perhaps, a solar panel, generating some power. Mm, let's see. You know, I, I, I don't have all the answers on that. I'm going to see what I, what I can get. Batteries. Uh, what have I done with it? Oh. That's the basic unit of the battery. It's a, these are 2170s. Um, four... 4.2 amp hour, 
uh, fully charged lithium batteries at about 4.2 volts. Most of the time, it's 3.7 volts. Uh, that's pretty brilliant, but it won't power the whole craft. The whole craft will have just over 900 of these. And the challenge is, how do you put them together? I'll come to that a bit later on. Electronic switch controller, which is this. Basically, in my case, takes in 50 volts DC from the battery and gives out what I'll simply call three-phase AC. If you're familiar with three-phase motors in your workshop, etc. Just for simplicity, considering, consider the motor as a three-phase motor. Um, and what that switch controller does is take that DC and turn it into a form of three-phase AC that will drive the motor. In Howard's paper, he referred to an inverter as an inverter. I think different industries call it different things. I, I'm very much picking up on the technology that seems to come out of the model aircraft world, which is uh, ESCs. Um, and then the motor. Um, that's the motor that I'm going to use for lift. Um, the thrust motor that I'm already testing is pretty similar to that. It's just a, an inch bigger in radius, two inches bigger diameter. Um, this one is rated by the Chinese <clears throat> at 35 kilowatts. That's, what, about 45 brake horsepower, something like that. Um, but that, you, you take, um, you, you put in, you know, exclamation marks around the rated because Chinese ratings are generous. Um, that's basically for a short term, you know, a few seconds. Most of the time it's rated at 15 kilowatts, so continuous, and I'm going to run it at five, so there's a I hope a good margin in that. As you can see, um, these are about the same weight as the steel chainsaw engines that we used back in 1972, and uh, fairly similar power. <coughs> Let's go for it in detail. As I've said, on the power supply side, if I take eight panels on the craft, some more panels... Um, maybe on my camper or scattered around. They produce, they're basically designed to charge 12 volt batteries. They produce about 18 volts. My, the batteries that I'm going to use on the craft, basically a 50 volt system. So this is the power controller, again from China, which takes in the uh, power from the solar panel, tweaks it to optimise the power, basically uh, converts it up to around about 50 volts to charge the battery and control the battery charging. So um, you have one of these for each four uh, solar panels. Um, so on the battery front, um, here's one of the... Uh, I'm aiming to have 15 kilowatts of battery capacity. This is one of six packs that will eventually power the cruising craft. It weighs 12 and a half kilos. It's got 154 of those batteries in it. In a... Um, 11 serials in parallel formation and 14 in series. So fully charged, it's about 58 volts. Most of it's working life, it's about 51 volts as, as you discharge it. When it's about to go flat on you, it's about 45 volts. Um, I'll, I, Anybody that wants to look into this in any more detail, this stuff will be around, I think, on the table out of the way somewhere for most of the day. Come and have a look. I'll show you inside there and the horrors of how I've wired all that up. It is a challenge, and Howard makes the very valid point that um, you really ought to buy those completely ready-made, and I agree, except the ready-made ones are about three grand, and I can make that for a grand, and when you multiply that by six, it becomes big, big numbers. Um, several kitchens worth of big numbers. All right. Um, yeah. Switch controller. Um, that's been a key battleground. I've burnt out two of those so far, um, Chinese switch controllers. Uh, these are they, nice beasties. Um, they don't basically work. I'll go through in detail a bit later on how, why they don't work. But the one that does work comes from Colic Park, Nottingham. The only British piece in the entire picture. Thank God. Uh, motor. Well, as I say, you'll see a video later. This is the original thrust engine motor. It caught fire in testing. 
lovely video of that. Uh, and is now burnt out. If you want to, you can come and see the charred coils or pile of scrap. I'm now using uh, the MP20. Th these code numbers, 20280 means it's 202 millimetres wide, about 8 inches, and 80 millimetres back to front deep. Okay, and it's a fairly common code that people use in this in world to tell you about the motors that they use. All right. So those are the four basics, power supply, batteries, switch controller, and motor. But overlooking that, you need some controls. And um, the first thing is something I lovingly call a craft management system, i.e. a dashboard. And here is the dashboard. It's actually live, except that it's really only a demo. But right now, you'll see a red flag on it, which is telling me that the battery's gone flat. Battery flat. <laughs> and to prove it, battery flat. Right. So if, if you're going, and uh, just to be more, you battery more helpful. Flat. When it was ten minutes to go, it said ten minutes to go, and five minutes to go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is a sunlight readable display, and I've tested that. It does work in British sunlight, anyway. Um, but I'm not guaranteed that I'm going to be looking at it all the time, even when it says something red. So I thought an audio system, as this craft's going to be so quiet it might as well have a stereo system on board and use it for audio warnings. Did you see the pigs flying by at that point? Mm. All right, so you've got a craft management system, which is um, basically the dashboard. And apart from telling you everything that's going on, it's also um, logging, and that's the key thing. You've got to log all the information. You've got to record it all so you can spend hours later working out why it caught fire. And then there's a throttle, which looks uh, pretty well like any craft throttle you've got, twist whip in this case, right? Um, and it's just a uh, potentiometer and puts a different voltage in, which drives the controller, and sets the throttle. Cut-off switch, which I seem to have forgotten to put in the box. You know, well, we need, you know, we've got all these hundreds of amps flowing around, we need a battery cut-off switch, don't we? Yeah, there's a challenge with that. If you turn off the battery, which is the obvious thing you're going to do, while the motor's running at full chat, that motor turns into a generator, generating maybe 18 kilowatts at that instant. Where's that 18 kilowatts going to go? Normally, it would go back into the battery and be regenerative braking in a car, etc. But if you've disconnected the battery, where's it going to go? Answer, it probably stays in the motor, causes the motor to get exceptionally hot very quickly, and catch fire. I actually think that's why that motor did catch fire, because I think the controller couldn't, con couldn't cope, and the controller went, if you like, open circuit, presented a motor, which at the time was running at 10 kilowatts, with nowhere to dump its power, so it burnt out instantly, as you'll see in the video later. So the cutoff, and we're going to have a safety cutoff, after all, you know. Um, what do you use for a cutoff? Well, at the moment, I'm thinking it's got to be something a bit cuter than a big on-off switch. It's got to be something that basically makes sure the motor has stopped in two or three seconds, shut the throttle or something, and then turns off uh, the battery. Uh, and at the same, well, in fact, early in that, probably turns off the solar power packs as well. And they have a similar problem, by the way, that you, that you can't just take the battery away from this the output side of that solar power controller, it, it too will cook. So you, there's a sort of shutdown sequence on that. So unfortunately, although it may well be on the craft, there's some big knobs labelled cut off. At the back of them is actually, sadly, some electronics that's doing a, you know, a phase shutdown over the next three or four seconds of the whole thing. And that's, you know, that's one, of my, one of my challenges to work out how to do that. All right, sticking with the lithium battery. I started out using a 100 volt battery um, some question marks about the safety of that. Um, so I worked out that I could actually use a 50 volt battery, which is pretty internationally accepted as non lethal. I spent 35 years in British Telecom and I have had hundreds of 50 volt battery shocks. Um, and it hurts, but unless you're on the top of a ladder or up a pole at the moment in time and you're not strapped on, it's basically non lethal. Right, 50 volts. Um, so 
I've now redesigned the system to work on 50 volts so that it's fundamentally safe. I think that's a key point because, um, you know, electric racing cars, I and mean, Graham will tell you all about the issues of finding marshals that are qualified to deal with the, was it 500 volts or whatever in their systems, etc., etc., etc. If we stick to 50 volts, we should be all right on that. Cell heating. This is, the, this is Conrad's battleground. Those, that battery that I showed you earlier is officially rated at, it will deliver 30 amps, 30 amps from an AA cell. Well, it will, but it gets very hot in the doing. I tried discharging a, a battery, a single cell, through a number of different resistors. I got it up to 25 amps, and it discharged in about five minutes from memory. But at the end of five minutes, it was up to 80, 80 degrees C. 80, 80. So I wouldn't want anything like that. Right? But what I discovered is that if I didn't discharge it at 30 amps, I discharged it at no more than about 10 amps, then it actually didn't go up much at all, maybe one or two degrees over a 25-minute period that it took to go flat. So my key safety message on the batteries, or one of them, is don't push the batteries that hard. In effect, have more battery capacity than, if you like, a simplistic design would teach you. You've got a weight penalty, yeah, but you can keep the battery so that each individual cell is not being asked to pull more than a third of its rating, and then it won't get too hot. Same goes on the rapid charging. I mean, you know, a lot of the problems on the charging side are trying to put power in in minutes. I'm not going to try and do that. It's going to be hours. It's slow charging. Um, each battery pack, maximum of 12 and a half kilograms, which that is. And then a key uh, issue is a battery management system, um, which is one of these. This is a blown up one. Got blown up one of everything, really. Um, basically, this looks at each of the 14 um, series of batteries, you know, the 14 batteries in, uh, cells in series, and it looks at each of the voltage levels there and makes sure that each of the batteries are about the same voltage. And if they're not, it will put a, a load resistor in to pull them down to the same voltage. That's crucial because if you let the battery get out of balance, as they call it, you could have a situation where, for example, half the cells are, at, are half charged and you're busy pumping in power to charge the thing up. And yet one load of cells is fully charged. So now those, you are overcharging. That's when one of the fires happens. Um, talking of fires, probably an appropriate point. Um, the craft will have two um, fire extinguishers on board and these aren't ordinary fire extinguishers, they're ones designed for lithium batteries. Yeah, it's a special powder for lithium. I've seen the video, it looks, it looks appropriate. Bloody expensive, about 75 quid each. But we'll see, and I hope I don't have to test it, but you know, that's what it'll have. Oh, look, I mean, that type size ended up a bit small, didn't it? The, the ESCs, this controller, as I say, the Chinese ESC you buy with it is proprietary. They don't tell you anything about software, they don't tell you anything about it at all. Chinese instructions are appalling, if, they get, if you get any at all. Um, it's set up for a specific prop. I've, I've seen videos. They have a, a second-floor office building somewhere in China, and there's a wire cage in the corner of the office, and it, there's a motor sitting there on a frame, and there's a five-foot diameter prop on it, and it's roaring away. And that's how they adjust the controller to suit that particular prop. When you put a different prop on, like you know, the multi-wing, which is heavier, different characteristics, and certainly that centrifugal, it doesn't work. And that's really why I burnt out two controllers, finding that out. Um, as I said earlier, they produce a trapezoidal wave, sort of a square wave, uh, which when you feed it into the motor, the motor is very efficient as being a loudspeaker. And it makes a hell of a noise. So you, get, you think you're running a jet engine in your back garden. Um, there's no, uh, the controller doesn't tell you anything about what the revs are uh, or what the temperature of anything is. It doesn't tell you anything in real-time information. There's no technical support. 
when one blew up, the Chinese just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, oh, and they're expensive. Uh, one to two grand, depending on which one. I found this um, British one made in Colic Park, designed by a Swedish guy called Benjamin Vedder. It's open source, software is fully available. It's tunable for different fans. I've had Benjamin Vedder himself sit beside the craft for 30 minutes. And the motor's making all sorts of noises, but at the end of it, it ran really smooth. He tuned the thing. And I'm hoping that we'll get that service again this year on the new fans somehow, even if he has to do it over the internet. Um, it's a sine wave. It's quiet. Much, much quieter. The difference is um, obvious. You get real-time data out of it. Tons of real-time data. Revs, temperatures of everything, um, speeds, graphs of the sine wave if you want it. You name it, it's all there. Technical support is brilliant. You can talk to the guy that designed it, and he's very helpful. Uh, and it's, um, a, this one's about 400 quid versus 1,000 to 2,000 for the Chinese ones. That's where we're going. Problem is, the most powerful one they do at the moment only does uh, 300 amps. And for my thrust engine, I need 600 amps. And I'm waiting for, a, a, there's a new version coming out. As of yesterday, I was told that was three weeks away. So hopefully for this summer, I'll have the full power version. Right, the motor. Um, I'm not going to get too techy. And sorry for the slides. There is another video coming in a minute. It'll be more interesting. Um, the key thing you need to know about these motors is the voltage drives the revs. How many volts you put into it fundamentally drives the revs. And these motors, they will quote you something called KV, which is not kilovolts, thousands of volts. It's a factor, if you like. Volts times KV gives you the maximum unloaded RPM. So that motor there, the lift motor, is uh, an 80, 80, 80 KV motor times 50 volts. Its maximum RPM without load on it's going to be 4,000 RPM. With a load on it, it's going to be about 3,200, about four-fifths, 80% of that. So basically, if you know the size of your battery, your voltage of your battery, and you know the KV rating of your motor, and you, in fact you buy a motor for a specific KV rating, you can define what's your, where's your maximum power revs going to be. Then the other interesting thing, we all know that electric motors are incredibly torquey. You know, whoa, it accelerates 0 to 60 and whatever mile an hour. Well, they are. But the key point to know is that the current is what drives the torque, not the volts. It's the current. And the torque per amp is that formula. And the key thing is to understand the difference between motor amps and, diff and battery amps, because I didn't for a year. So you can short circuit that year. I'll explain it to you. All right? Coming out of the battery is, let's say, 100 amps. Going into the controller, What's then going into the motor? Um, well, if you want 100 amps in the motor, sorry, the motor is acting like a generator and is fighting you putting power into it. So although you're putting in 50 volts, it might be generating 35 volts. So you've only actually got a net gain of 15 volts. So if, you, if that formula above there says you want 100 amps, then it's 100 amps on 15 volts, not 100 amps on 50 volts. Right. Um, so the gist of it is that what turns out to be 100 amps coming out of the battery can turn out to be 300 amps going into the motor, 300 motor amps, which is why I'm looking for a controller that can handle 600 amps. It's only going to be 200 amps load out of the battery, but that's what I need out of the motor. All these formulas, I've now created a spreadsheet. So is anybody interested in going down this route? I have a spreadsheet which will short circuit a year of work in trying to design a hovercraft, certainly in my case, um, because it's all there and you can run all your options with that. Um, there's a whole question about whether you direct drive it, i.e. take advantage of the torque, high torque, and mount the fan straight on the motor. That's what I'm doing because I hate mechanical engineering. Right? And I don't like drive shafts. One of the big problems with the quiet craft is the amount of drive shafts, belts, and mechanical stuff, 20 kilograms of it on uh, Q1. And if you mount the fan direct on the motor and you put the motor behind the fan, because you can, because it's small and it's light, you don't have all that 20 kilograms of drive shafts, belts, brrr. 
So that's one of the things that makes it attractive to me for direct drive. But don't forget that kilowatts power is a combination of torque, how powerful this motor will twist something, and revs. You know, in the two-stroke world, we're getting all our power from revs, 7,000, 10,000 RPM. All right? Here, I'm talking about a motor doing 1,600 RPM, so there's not a lot of rev-driven power, if you like. It's all about torque-driven power. So it may well be that a, a racing craft, should we ever get there and solve Howard's challenge, um, is belt-driven. But I'm not doing that for simplicity. OK, here's the one you've all been waiting for. All right, that's my back garden. Um, over on the right is one of Nita's uh, ceramic statues. That's the shed, otherwise known as Mission Control. So in there is a whole bank of computers and whatever. Loads of cables hanging out the window, which are connected to the test rig. Uh, those of you who went to Whittle, uh, um, the last race meeting will have seen that test rig there. This is it with the original Chinese motor and the original Chinese controller. So it is noisy and something dramatic happens. Hear that whistle? That doesn't exist now with the new controllers. And that was a couple of grand gone. <laughs> and here's the child wreckage. Right. So, um, oh, and uh, yes, I've cut the point at which I'm, I'm coming out of the shed with the fire extinguisher. <laughs> In fact, the flames only shot that far out from the motor, so it didn't catch anything. <clears throat> so that was that test. Uh, okay, um, here's the Raspberry Pi that I waved at you earlier. Uh, here it is, sat in the bow of my new craft steering column. Um, it's uh, down here is a series of data. What's the revs on the lift? What's the power consumption? Five kilowatts. What's the temperature of the uh, motor and the temperature of the controller? Same thing on the right hand side for uh, the thrust engine. Across the top, my compass heading, my speed. Both of those come from GPS units that are already in the box but not yet working. Um, how many minutes I've got left? 15 minutes. What's the current time? It's the only thing that actually works right now is the current time. Um, down the bottom, how much power I'm getting in from my left-hand solar panels, right-hand solar panels, what's the volts of the battery, right? Data, stuff. And all of that is logged every second, all right? So that when things go wrong, like that bang, I can go back and look and see what exactly happened. I can tell you, for example, the motor did not heat up prior to that. It was running at 37 degrees. At the instant that it was on fire, it went up. 50, 60 degrees, I think, was recorded. And it came down again pretty quickly. So it wasn't that it motor was you know, cooking for five minutes beforehand. It went up extremely quickly because I think about 10 kilowatts of power was basically dissipated in that little space because I think what had happened is the controller had gone, had stopped. The processor had basically stopped, left it open circuit, so motor's generating, no battery to dump the power into because it's been disconnected. Uh, and hence the fire. Um, and that's, that didn't matter, but the graph in the middle is just one of the techie outputs of the thing I've already got from that. Okay, so progress so far. Uh, the thrust unit was tested last summer. I'm awaiting this new controller, which will treble the power, I hope. Um, and that's not available for, well, I hope, we hope for three weeks' time. There's a three-seater hull, 95% complete. It's 13 by 7. It's based on an Osprey 3, for those that have long memories. Um, happens that Simon has had an Osprey 3 sat in my you know, garage for some months, years now, and uh, I've been able to copy it. Um, hopefully, that new craft will go up to Simon's in a week or so to be sprayed so that it looks a nice, bright, is it Lamborghini green we're going for? Something in your face. Yeah. Um, the lift fan has just arrived from China, and the motor... Um, uh, no, the lift fan didn't come from China. The lift fan came from South Wales. Um, but the motor's come from China. I've got the converter kit that basically allows that motor to couple to that fan. So my plan is to get the whole thing together and test it 
as a cruiser at race meetings this summer. Not the first race meeting, hopefully Whittlebury onwards. Um, I think it's going to be at least a year before I ever get the eye on salt water because the challenges faced by salt water and Medway mud are another step on. Um, I can tell you that there's about a 10 foul clearance between the rotating part of that motor and the fixed part of the motor and the slightest bit of workshop grit that gets in there, and I produce lots of it when I'm fiberglass sanding, you know, um, will seize the motor. So, uh, you know, Medway mud has got to be kept out of it and that's another stage of the problem. Filters, basically. So that's the craft as she was yesterday. Lift fan is in the bow. Um, air intake is either side of the dashboard computer in the centre there. Um, T-shaped seating, centre one, obviously, for the driver, and two potential seats for the grandkids at the back. And the eccentric duct at the back, which I didn't point out, but that's the Malcolm Cox-designed... I call it eccentric duct. It's got a much bigger curve, inlet curve, on the sides of the duct to the top and bottom of the duct. And that is designed by Malcolm, who, as you know, is the chief aerodynamicist at um, Griffin, um, as potentially a way to reduce fan stall and go around corners. Uh, and I'm interested in that, obviously, from a performance perspective, but I'm also interested from a noise perspective, because it makes a noise. I don't like noises. So... Whether or not it works, whether it's bloody huge air brake, um, et cetera, et cetera, we'll find out. Okay, um, any questions? Battered you into submission. Can you talk to whether the motor could be rewired? Um, it probably can if I can find somebody in the UK that has the skills to do it. I mean, there's lots of companies that will rewire a motor for you, but whether they can do that motor, I don't know. Um, I'm sad to say all of this... I think all of this stuff, the, these boards, could be repaired. But the trouble is that if I repair them, they're still running the Chinese software, which isn't bloody helpful. Um, unless I... You know, I could. They're all processor-driven. I could flash them with different software. Da -da -da -da. But I haven't got the time to do all this, frankly. So I'm guilty of putting them into a box labelled one day. Yes, love? Um, is the blade gate of the, in the motor totally poor? No, I don't think so. Um, if the, if the motor will, will go up to its unloaded re max revs, yeah. which for the sake of the, that truss motor is, is 2,000 RPM. Um, and it, 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 it should be fine at that. It will, of course, be generating power, uh, and I, I need a battery to sink that power. All right, but um, no, it should be okay. Yes, it does. Right. It's exactly like your car, and in fact, it's a key feature. That it has to, because if it doesn't, you've got this problem of ten to twenty kilowatts in a small motor. Where's it going to go? It's going to heat the thing. And as I say, I think that's what's caused the fire already. So, although if you think about it, we're never going to freewheel downhill, and you're never going to get the recycle, you know, the regenerative braking effects that you would do in a car, but nevertheless, from a safety perspective, being able to dump that excess power somewhere is essential. Yes, Yeah. Have you looked at the electric motorbike side stuff yet? Um, yes, I did. Right at the beginning, I, uh, um, I mean, Owen had gone down the, um, if you like, the model aircraft-driven route, drone-driven route, and I, I kind of naturally followed him down that, but I also looked around at what was available. Um, and what I found was, yes, there are hub motors, essentially, for motorbikes and, and cars and so on that you can buy, but they tended to be a lot heavier. Instead of, say, six, seven kilograms same sort of power level, they tended to be at 30 kilograms. Um, and they tended to... they actually more torquey, which is great, but the torque was up to 1,000 RPM, which is a bit too low for the bloody fan. I'm looking for something in the 1,500, 1,600 range. So I couldn't really make that work. Um, well, again, I went down the route of following the speed controllers that came with the motors, and that turned into a mistake because the Chinese motors, speed controllers, are definitely set up for the you know, lightweight carbon fiber props. They can't handle this. 
that sort of thing. Um, so I've ended up going with a speed control that has its origins in electric skateboards. This company in, North, in Nottingham that make these things, their main business is electric skateboards. Yes, they're basically the same, yeah. The key difference is the software and the fact that it's open source and got one hell of a lot more features than the, the Chinese ones. Any more questions? Oh. Where does that impact, um, At the end of the day, it's going to depend on how the trim comes out. My plan is it goes in the... Engine bay, well, you, you, in the old, you know, originally it was the engine bay here. And um, my plan is that there's up to six of those in a kind of shelving setup in there. They're obviously, easily removable in case I have to take them back to the camper to recharge them and all that jazz. But this duct unit is overweight um, for what I wanted because I've made it too thick because it's a one off complicated duct. Um, and the frame arrangement that I've got at the moment is also overweight because, again, I've over-engineered it. It's mechanical engineering, so I double everything, you know, treble everything. Um, so it may go along like that. So the seats, which you can see uh, uh, um, in the centre there, have been built big enough that the batteries, or some of the batteries, could go under the seats to bring the weight forward. So it'll be a question of when I first hover it, find out what the trim is like and go accordingly. Uh, three quid. That's on, that's on my current household rate, which is 19, pound a kilo, uh, 19, pound, 19 pence a kilowatt. Yeah. <laughs> 19 pence a kilowatt hour. <laughs> but actually, I mean, I'm fairly confident that if, I, if we've 800 watts on it, if I leave the craft out in the sun at home, that after two or three days, even on, a, on an awful, you know, cloudy days, it will actually have got 15 kilowatts of power in it. In fact, it could become a net exporter of power. I'm seriously looking at the fact that since I've got one to two kilowatts, or will have one to two kilowatts of solar panels and 15 kilowatt hours of battery, you know, I only take the craft out about every month. The other three weeks, it could be sitting there running my house, particularly in the summer when there's no heating loads. So I might go off grid and run it off the other craft. It just needs a, a two kilowatt inverter, which I've got a couple hundred quid. So. That's one of the reasons why I one of my problems with the current system is that you justify yourself to spend some grand on some batteries to do one of these investigation projects because you could actually yeah. power it out for half the day on it. Yeah. If you manage. Yeah, well, in the summer, I mean, 15 kilowatt hours will probably run it all week. Oh, well, well <clears throat> you're not listening to this, but uh, i.e. regs don't come into it, but it'll be turn the mains off and plug in um, <laughs> a, a cable coming out of the hovercraft. <clears throat> yeah, literally. Yeah, I mean, not elegant and probably not, you know, by the robot. Okay. One final bit. I was asked to, ask to say something about ALS. Um, the, 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 the club, the competition committee, seems to be interested in, in doing lap timing again. Um, and uh, we've gone around various circles about do we reintroduce tags, do we buy them, do we make more of the old ones? Uh, I'm suggesting that instead of tags, which are costly, take a lot of maintenance on somebody's part, we use modern technology. And what technology I'm exploring is a small camera, as some of you will have seen it at race meetings last summer, uh, with an AI chip in it, artificial intelligence chip in it. And basically, you can teach the artificial intelligence chips to read a number or recognise somebody's face or tell if they've got a mask on or have they got a black helmet on or whatever you want to train it to, to recognise. Yeah. Um, and um, essentially, I've tested two models. One says, that's a number plate. That's a number plate. That works about 98% accurate at the moment. Um, and then it cuts out that, what it thinks is a number plate, and passes it to the second model, which says, 
and the number in that is 173. Now that model, second model, is not as good, largely because our number plates are all over the place. Right? So um, first thing is to try and regularize the number plates, and the second thing is to uh, train, the, retrain the model on, um, on, on, on regularized number plates. And because I can't actually define, we have a bit of a challenge. We thought we'd got a complete definition of a regularized number plate. And then it was pointed out right at the last minute that actually on a Colt craft, that was a number plate that wouldn't fit on the duct. Right. So we've got a challenge to come up with a number plate that can be read 98% of the time reliably, uh, the right font, etc., size, spacing between the numbers, all that sort of thing, but fits on a, uh, a Colt craft duct. And that's the process I'll be going through this summer, as well as testing the electric overcraft. I don't take things on easily, I'm afraid. So you'll see that process going on. The number, is it possible, uh, as well as the number, to have a barcode? Yeah, yes, you could, but... No, um, it, it, if you get the right number plate design and, and model soft, AI software, it's just as easy to read a number. And we need the number anyway, the manual reading of the number. So, my, yeah, we could go down the barcode route, but my focus is I think we can actually read a number. But we've just get, got to get the number right. We've got to get the software right. So, understand what Peter said. Uh, we did a load of work on, on quanta numbers and aspect ratios. It's all about black space and white space, basically. The, the constraint is what is a cold duct, uh, 3D to cold duct, having enough space to clear, and also defining what a number is that everybody can, can use. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I've also asked that people don't slope the numbers. The reason for that is that when you take a picture of a craft that's at an oblique angle, the numbers slope anyway. And if you've got a craft that's already got sloping numbers, the two slopes together, and you know, you've been there before, become something that is no longer recognisable as a number. Right, so to kind of try and minimise the, the, the problem space, I've said none of these clever italic numbers that slope at an angle, please. Just keep them straight and, and upright. Okay? All right. Okay? Right, that's me done. <laughs>